Uh, good evening, everybody. <coughs> Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. Today we have Pursue 9D Cytopathology and we are streaming live from Kuwait City via Kolkata. And today uh, we are in our continuation with our first lecture of FNSC on thyroid lesions. This is session 2. And today we'll be dealing with Bethesda 5 and 6. And to talk on this is Dr. Minmay Kumar Malik, who is a postgraduate from PGI Chandigarh a consultant cytopathologist in Mubarak Al-Kabir Hospital, Kuwait, an expert in cytopathology. His first session on thyroid was excellent. It was viewed by more than 1,500 people worldwide, and everybody is waiting for this second episode. So we are here. And before I ask Dr. Minmay Malik to start, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request uh, Dr. Minmay Malik, sir, please share your screen and start your presentation. Just press present now on the right side. Yeah. yeah. And your entire screen. Yes. And press on the center and share. Great. I can see your yeah. screen coming. Yes, sir. Please make it full screen. Uh, I guess we are on full screen, now. Yeah, you are on full screen, yeah. Please start, thank you. So, and should I click hide? I think I should click... Yeah, you should hide. press hide, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah that's better. Okay, that's better. Uh, thank Please you, start. Nadim. As usual, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the Bethesda categories 5 and 6, which means the categories that are called, in general terms, suspicious for malignancy and the malignant ones. So before we go into the suspicious for malignancy and malignant categories, I would like to just uh, revise the Bethesda system of reporting thyroid pathology uh, table. And these are the two parts which are uh, boxes in green, suspicious for malignancy and malignant which we are going to be talking about today. The important thing that we should all realize is the fact that in spite of them being put under two different categories, the usual management protocol is more is, is the same. So in both of them, it is either near total thyroidectomy or lobectomy. Both of them, uh, as far as the implied risk of malignancy is concerned, if NIFT is considered a carcinoma, is from 45 to 60 in case of suspicious for malignancy and goes up to 94 to 96 percent in uh, the malignant tumors. So with this, I start with Bethesda uh, category 5. So the category 5, sorry, this is actually 5, is suspicious for malignancy. And by definition, this is very important, the psychomorphological features should raise a strong suspicion of malignancy, but the findings fall short of being sufficient for a conclusive diagnosis. Now, there are different circumstances under which we use this category, and these are situations where we say that the aspirate is suspicious for a papillary thyroid carcinoma. This actually accounts for most of the times you are going to put this uh, under this category, followed by suspicious for medullary thyroid carcinomas, suspicious for lymphoma, and there is something which is suspicious NOS. That means you think there is some kind of malignancy, but you are not sure that what kind of malignancy it is. So, suspicious for malignancy, papillary thyroid carcinoma, uh, the key underlying guiding principles and concepts are as follows. Now, although understanding and appreciating the nuclear features are most crucial, the deciding factors weigh heavier with regards to quantitative measures as compared to qualitative measures. And we are going to see what that means. In these cases, microfollicles are absent or insignificant. So if you have a lot of microfollicles, it is not going to come under this particular category. Usually it doesn't come under this category. It goes under the category of follicular neoplasm, suspicious for follicular neoplasm, unless and until you are absolutely sure that you are dealing with a follicular variant of papillary carcinoma or NIFTP. Herthel cells in these 
in this category are usually absent or insignificant unless and until you are dealing with something like a Herthel cell or an oncocytic variant of a papillary thyroid carcinoma or an oncocytic variant of a medullary carcinoma which comes in very very rarely in this particular group. Intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions are absent or extremely rare. Most of the time when you are going to put things under this category, things usually fall short of a papillary thyroid carcinoma and that's because of the fact that intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions are rare or absent. And also papillary structures or samoma bodies in association with the nuclear features are also absent with very rare exceptions. So these are some of the key underlying fundamental concepts of this particular group. So let's start with the first one, and that is the suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. And what are the situations under which we come to this particular diagnosis? And there's a lot of words over here, and I have made it easier a little in the next slide with sort of a table. But just to uh, make this thing clear, uh, there are four separate circumstances where we put this particular term of suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Under, in, in the situation A, I mean, I'm just calling it A, the cellularity is moderate to high, but most of the cells are benign looking, right? So most of the cells are benign looking, moderate to high cellularity, but there are a few cells which are going to show nuclear enlargement, chromatin pallor, nuclear margin irregularities, grooves, nuclear moldings. So these are found in a small proportion of cells in a situation where most of the cells are benign. Intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions are going to be very few, or I mean, let us say that they are going to be absent most of the time. And even if there are a few, well, it goes into something else. And there are no samoma bodies or papillary structures are seen as I've mentioned in the previous slide. So the first one, is a situation where most cells are benign and a few cells show these features. In the second situation, most of the cells are, they have some kind of an abnormality, but these are not going to show too many nuclear irregularities and nuclear molding is going to be minimal or absent. Otherwise, you are going to have chromatin pallor, some degree of nuclear enlargement and some amount of nuclear groups and most of the cells are showing this abnormality, but once again, it falls short of calling of, of you know, of a particular situation where you can uh, confidently say that this is a papillary carcinoma. And that is because you do not find nuclear membrane irregularities, you do not find intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, and you do not find some more bodies or papillary structures. The third one is very interesting. Here you find classic features of papillary thyroid carcinoma which means that you're going to find nuclear uh, chromatin pallor, nuclear groups, inclusions, maybe some samoma bodies, papillary structures, but still why don't we call it a papillary thyroid carcinoma? That is because the cellularity is extremely sparse. So under these circumstances, because the cellularity is very sparse, and I can tell you different people have got different kind of threshold, but if even if you see very classic features of papillary thyroid carcinoma, and the cellularity is extremely low, you might just like to pull down a little bit and just call it as suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. The last one in this group is a cystic degeneration pattern where you have lots of Fermi and hemosiderin laden macrophages and you have got cells with enlarged pale nuclei, some nuclear groups and even a rare intranuclear inclusion. So these are the four major situations where you use the term suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now, this is a table just to make things a bit easier. I've compared pattern A, B, and C. Pattern D is the one with the, with the, with the cyst cells, so I've just left it apart. So the difference is that the number of benign cells are, are much more in pattern A. So benign cells are the predominant cells in pattern A, whereas in pattern B, benign looking cells where you are absolutely certain that they are benign. I should use the phrase benign looking cells, where you can confidently call benign. These cells are few in number. In pattern A, the abnormal cells are fewer in number compared to pattern B, but the degree of nuclear abnormalities, especially with relation to nuclear membrane irregularities and molding, is present in pattern A 
but it is not present in pattern B to a great extent. If this would have been present in pattern B, with this amount of cellularity, you would possibly go and go and pull the trigger and call it straight a papillary thyroid carcinoma. Pale chromatin, seen in both. Intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, papillary structures, somoma bodies are not seen in any one of them. In pattern C, you see all the features. You can even see intranuclear inclusions, but you call it suspicious just because of the fact that the cellularity is extremely low. That means you have got very few cells showing the classic features of papillary thyroid carcinoma. And I hope that some of these are going to be clearer as I go into the pictures. So let's look at the first pattern. So this is pattern A. Remember, Remember that most of the areas are going to look like this. So these are benign thyroid follicular cells. There is a significant amount of colloid in the background. And then suddenly you see some areas where you have got these groups of cells. You can see that they have relatively paler chromatin, some amount of nuclear irregularities, and a few grooves lying here and there. So this is the one which you are going to call suspicious for uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma and this is the so-called pattern A but of course you are not going to mention this words or phrases like pattern A in your report. This is just for our uh, contextual and conceptual uh, understanding. Now this one is what I would call pattern B. You have got many cells which look like this. So the cells have got, so most important findings are that the cells have pretty pale chromatin but you see that the nuclear membrane are more or less sharp, maybe a few grooves here and there. You have these cells, you don't see any inclusions, you don't see papillae, you don't see uh, samoma bodies, but you see a lot of these cells. Now I'm sure many people would possibly find that this is enough to call something a papillary thyroid carcinoma. Fair enough, but some might not. So when you have these features, you do not see too, many of, too much of nuclear membrane irregularities, uh, not very, uh, no inclusions, you might still decide to, okay, I'm not going to call it papillary thyroid carcinoma straight. I'm going to just fall back a little bit, call it suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. I know anyway that the management plan is uh, more or less the same. Now, this is pattern C. Look at this. So, you have got this huge intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusion here. You have got the grooves, pale chromatin. This cell has got almost two or three inclusions lying over here. So you're pretty certain that these features are consistent with pathway papillary thyroid carcinoma. But imagine a situation where you only find one cluster of such cells or maybe another cluster somewhere. So you might just get, uh, you know, uh, a little bit worried and you say, no, I'm not going to call this a papillary thyroid carcinoma. I'm just going to fall back a little bit and call it suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. The third one is the cystic pattern, where you have got a lot of foamy macrophages, hemosiderin laden macrophages, some of these elongated cells, a little bit of a, a you know, irregular chromatin pattern, you know, you have got a lot of cyst cells, so you might even start seeing some cells with kind of oncocytic change, but then you have got a few cells having kind of a dark cerebral from nuclei, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So this is the so-called cystic pattern, where you decide to call something as suspicious for a pre-thyroid carcinoma. So, with this, we go into the next group, which is called suspicious for medullary thyroid carcinoma. And I'll be very honest, there's hardly ever that we usually use this phrase once you have a good access to immunohistochemistry and you've got enough material to do your immunohistochemistry, you are, usually we do not use it. But then still, sometimes you may need to use this. So, in this uh, particular group, the cellularity is sparse to moderate, the cytomorphological features suggest a medullary thyroid carcinoma or a situation where a differentiation between a medullary thyroid carcinoma and a lymphoreticular malignancy is difficult. And also in situations where you have got some material, we are not very absolutely confident about the cytomorphological feature, you would love to do some immunocytochemistry but you do not have enough material or maybe your cell block suddenly uh, didn't work that day and you know you don't have and you can't call the patient back for a repeat FNAC. So under these circumstances you can use this phrase suspicious for medullary thyroid carcinoma and uh, let them take it up from there. And this would be an image where you might 
come across such a situation. Well, a kind of a moderate sparse cellularity. You've got these cells. You've got this plasma cytoid cell over here. Two of them. One here. Some cells uh, have a very scanty amount of cytoplasm. You are pretty certain that this is a medullary thyroid carcinoma, but then you'd like to do some immunos. And, you know, you don't have the uh, enough material to run the immunos. So, well, you can just call it suspicious for medullary thyroid carcinoma and let it go from there. Now, this is the last one of the suspicious group, which is called suspicious for uh, malignancy NOS. Now, what would you call something when you come across a group of cells like this? As you see, these cells are rather pleomorphic. Uh, they have a pretty abnormal looking chromatin. I've got a game cell over here. So you know that I'm possibly dealing with a very, uh, some kind of very nasty malignancy. And uh, that is the only cluster that you have of all the aspirates. So do you just let it pass? You just call it ATP of undetermined significance. But I think it's a little bit more of that. So you're pretty certain this is malignant. Look at this one. Look at the pleomorphism over here. But very few cells like this in a smear which is extremely hemorrhagic. You are unable to really assess the morphology very well. So well, in the, these circumstances also, you can call something as suspicious for malignancy. So we have come across four separate situations where you can call something as suspicious for malignancy under different circumstances. The next one is something where I think we come across rather frequently, where you call something as suspicious for a lymphoma. Now, I'm going to talk much more about the lymphomas affecting the thyroid gland towards the end of the lecture, but let me just remind you, there are two common situations of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma affecting the thyroid. The diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, where you have got a large population of extremely large cells and, uh, uh, and everything is fine, but you see for some reason that, uh, you know, uh, the cells are possibly mixed with certain, under certain circumstances, mixed with a small popula uh, population of smaller cells, you are not very sure. So under those circumstances, you have got a population of very large cells and then you have a few small cells, uh, you know, a significant number of small cells mixed here and there. You're not very sure. You can call it suspicious for lymphoma. But I can assure you that this particular diagnosis of suspicious for lymphoma, you hardly would ever do in a case of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Most of the times, you are going to come across this situation when you are dealing with so-called MALTs, things which turn out to be malt lymphomas of the thyroid where the population of the cells are more smaller, medium-sized cells. There is usually a mix of cells and you are not sure whether you are dealing with a reactive population of lymphoid cells or are you dealing with a malt lymphoma. Under these circumstances, you can call it suspicious for a lymphoma and then you ask for ancillary tests like flow cytometry and then look for the clonality and, if you, and then uh, you can call it a lymphoma after your flow cycle, flow results. Otherwise, you, if you do not have access to flow or you cannot send the material for flow, you can put a strong suspicion for a lymphoma without directly calling it a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And this would be one possibly such picture. It's a pretty monotonous population, but still you have a population of pretty small, smaller cells, some larger cells, right? So some people might think, okay, this is fine. I, I'm okay with this, calling this a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But some might say that, no, I just want to uh, fall short a little bit and I just call it suspicious for a lymphoma and leave it as such. So, the, going to the next category and that is Bethesda category 6 or malignant. So, the first one, the commonest one, peppery thyroid carcinoma. And first, we are going to talk about peppery thyroid carcinoma, the classic and the usual or slash usual type. Let's look at the parts. Now, as far as the arrangement or architecture is concerned, you see papillae and you see monolayers. You see a bit of a significant amount of nuclear crowding. You see swirling of the nuclei around some kind of a central point and you see a significant degree of nuclear molding. Now when you look at the cells, this is where the real money is. And most of us diagnose papillary carcinomas based on the appearance of the nuclei. This is the most important thing. And the most important, the most common thing that you find in papillary carcinomas uh, is this one. You see nuclei with pale powdery chromatin. 
you are going to come across intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions. We really love to see intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions because it really buttresses our diagnosis. Okay, so once we see, as long as you do not see this intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, we are not really very confident. But once you start seeing them, well, we know that we are dealing with a papillary thyroid carcinoma, although intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions may be found in other conditions, including benign conditions. Another thing which looks pretty striking and catches our attention are longitudinal nuclear groups. You can also see thick nuclear membranes, marginally placed micronucleoli. I don't see too many of these to be very honest. Sometimes I do see irregular nuclear shape with cerebriform nuclei. These features also capture and catch your attention. The other features you may find are samoma bodies, of course. You all know of samoma bodies. Of chewing gum, gummy colloid, sometimes you may come across some multinucleated giant cells. And of course, there are various companion cells. There are oncocytes, some histiocytoid cells, some squamoid cells. And you'd be surprised, I used to be quite surprised that quite often the features that we look for, like intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, often show up better in the oncocytic cells, which accompany the usual population of papillary thyroid carcinoma cells. I mean, we have seen many such instances. So let's look at some of the slides. So this is the papillary thyroid carcinoma, the usual type, a low power view, and you see the classic arrangement of papillae with cells coming out of the papillae. And here you have the core, fibrovascular core, and you can see here are the cells. Which is, so once you see something like this, well, it looks pretty straightforward, although we have to remember that in, in, in situations where you have colloid gutter, of course, there you have lots and lots of colloid, you can find papillae. So just the presence of papillae without other features does not mean that we are dealing with the papillary thyroid carcinoma. Here is a sheet of cells. So here's the so-called sheet of cell where it's this degree of crowding of the nuclei. You're also seeing the pale chromatin. You're going to see another slide of that. But here, I just want to show you the sheet of cells, some degree of nuclei pressing into each other, kind of nuclear molding, slightly elongated shape. That is very significant. You know, the cells are usually very a little bit elongated compared to other cells. Slight alteration in the morphology, but the most striking feature even at this magnification is the fact that the chromatin is extremely pale. So, sometimes you have this tendency of the cells to go round in rolls, right? like onion skins, that is another thing which you find in papillary thyroid carcinomas. And this is of course a beautiful slide. This is a slide showing all, everything that you'd like to get a mental picture of what exactly is pale chromatin. A few cells have dark chromatin here and there, but more or less this is what the so-called pale chromatin is all about. And once you have seen it, it creates quite an impression uh, inside your brain. And so usually once you see that, it becomes a pretty easy diagnosis. Right. Now, you could also see a significant amount of nuclear membrane irregularities like you see over here. You see another slide. I think I have kept one more slide. And of course, these longitudinal nuclear grooves, right, which make them look like coffee beans. And this is a picture over here just to show the comparison. So these are cells showing nuclear membrane irregularities. The chromatin in this side is not very, not that pale. Here the chromatin is pretty pale. But then you have got this longitudinal nuclear grooves going from one end of the nucleus to the other end of the circumference, one over here. So these things are pretty easy. Now, another thing that we may find in papillary thyroid carcinomas are cerebriform nuclei because of the nuclear membrane irregularities. Some of them can be very dark mummified cerebriform cells. And actually, we were the first ones, uh, our team was the first ones back in 2004 to describe the presence of dark and analyze the presence of dark and pale cerebriform nuclei in a series of cases. And this is the first time it was published in literature, the presence of dark and pale cerebriform nuclei and FNA smears of usual papillary thyroid carcinomas and its variant. Uh, back in 2004, it was published in Diagnostic Cytopathology. So I managed to get one of the pictures to show you over here. Now, 
The next thing which we all like to see are samoma bodies and the samoma bodies can take all kinds of shapes and forms. So this is what is one of them here. It looks like the petals of a, of a flower, flower petals. This looks like, like almost like, it reminds me of a jellyfish. You see how things, strands going down. This is on a gimsa. You see the samoma bodies with some kind of a uh, refractile substance right in the middle because of calcium. And if you want to get a kind of a lowdown on samoma bodies and how they are formed, this is an excellent article uh, which was penned by uh, Professor Dilip Das. Uh, it was published way back. Uh, I think it was in 2006 or seven. Okay, I've given you the reference over here. So he really worked on uh, on this particular aspect to, sh to show how samoma bodies are formed in papri thyroid carcinoma. So it's an excellent article if you'd like to take a look at it. Now, these are the papillary thyroid carcinoma, usual the intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions. No problem with these ones. There are at least around seven inclusions in this single cell, some inclusions coming up over here, and the intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions. I like to see them because it makes things very easy. But then I think in the previous uh, webinar, I was asked that. Uh, are there any inclusion lookalikes? Actually, there are. You are going to see this slide again a little bit later on, but this is what an inclusion should look like, uh, especially on an MGG. But this exact, this is not an inclusion, by the way. This is some kind of an artifact which has come on the cell, and this again is not an inclusion. If you compare the uh, the the color, this is an. These are RBCs, so this is possibly an RBC which is lying on top of a cell, giving it an appearance of an inclusion, but this is not. At intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusion. This can happen because you are looking for inclusions and then you are fit into the diagnosis of a papillary thyroid carcinoma and we think that we are dealing with an inclusion but this is not exactly an inclusion. Although well, this may be from a case of papillary thyroid carcinoma, this is. But just to show you that this particular thing over here with an arrow is not an inclusion. Now, this is uh, another thing which talk about chewing gum colloid, the gummy colloid. Once again, gummy colloid may be found in papillary thyroid carcinomas, but most often you see gummy colloid is actually not in papillary thyroid carcinoma. You can see gummy colloid in colloid goiters also mixed with the general other appearances of the colloid that you are, you are more familiar with. So this is gummy colloid. So there are other kinds of cells which frequently accompany papillary thyroid carcinomas. For example, you can have multiplicated giant cells. You can have oncocytic cells. Doesn't really make it a Oncocytic variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, you can just see the difference between the two cells. These cells have abundant amount of cytoplasm, and these are the usual cells that you find in papillary thyroid carcinoma. So only when these cells are the major population of cells that you are going to call it something else. We are going to discuss about those things, that particular entity, a little bit later on. So you can find some oncocytic cells with papillary thyroid carcinoma, and you can also find some spindly cells. This is not really the best of slides. There's a bit of a clot, but I couldn't get anything better than these, but I have definitely seen better spindly cells which occur in association with papillary thyroid carcinomas. The next one is a difficult one. This is the follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma and the non-invasive follicular tumors with papillary-like nuclear features. On FNA, they show more or less the same features. Now, the first point that I would like to make, and this is an extremely important point, before you go into the nuclei and the cells in general, we should take a very good look at the architecture because from the architecture and arrangement, you can sometimes get a pretty nice hint that we are possibly dealing with this entity. We see syncytial fragments with microfollicles emanating out of those fragments and sometimes you see fragments with staghorn outlines with some dispersed microfollicles in the background. So look for these syncytial fragments and look for the microfollicles coming out of the fragments and this low power appearance of syncytial fragments with staghound heart outlines, I find them to be extremely helpful to just, you know, give me a kind of a hint. So, as far as the cells are concerned, you can have in two different situations, right? One of them is that you may be lucky and you may find readily identifiable nuclear features associated with papillary thyroid carcinoma, in which case, it's very easy. You just call it a papillary thyroid carcinoma usual. But sometimes the nuclear features associated with papillary thyroid carcinomas are not readily identifiable. And 
Follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma slash NIFTP are notorious for this. So they are they might be missed. And there is a mild nuclear enlargement. The chromatin clearing is there. There is a thickening of nuclear membrane and there could be some cerebriform nuclei. So in spite of not having the intranuclear, intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusion, cerebriform nuclei can be of great help. Nuclear grooves can be very few and intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions are usually absent. So this particular group can be tricky, it can be a pitfall, you might miss it, but usually you will find usually, usually you find enough of microfollicles to at least put it in the group of follicular neoplasm slash suspicious for follicular neoplasm and not miss it. But there have been situations where you have a, some amount of colloid in the background and they might have been put sometimes even, you know, if you are not very aware, you might see the colloid and even call it benign. Okay, but most often than not, you would be a little bit careful now with the popularity of this particular phrase, AUS flus, you might put it in that group, right? But usually not because the cellularity is pretty high. So most often than not, you would possibly put it in follicular neoplasm slash suspicious for follicular neoplasm group. The other things which may be found are gummy colloid. Sometimes they may be trapped within micro follicles. And you can sometimes see some semoma bodies and multinucleated chances. Now look at these pictures. This is extremely important. I see this is possibly the most important of the uh, of the slides that I'm going to show today of follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. It is extremely important to look at the low power. And on the low magnification, you are going to find these clusters and see the staghorn outlines. This is very important. Staghorn outlines are extremely vital. Right? And you see some follicles coming out of them. Now, you might wonder, what is the difference from a usual variant? Now, this is a usual variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. You, have, you see a nice juicy core over here, of connective tissue. Right? Some vessels running through. And the cells are at the margin. Most of the epithelial cells are at the margin. So this is the usual tissue fragment, papillary tissue fragment, of papillary thyroid carcinoma, usual type. Whereas in the follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma slash NIFTP, you see the frag the tissue fragments look different. You usually don't see that kind of a core. And you see that the epithelial cells are going right in and they form this kind of a little bit of projections like staghorns, and then they come out a little bit as microfollicles here and there. So it is extremely important to appreciate the low power magnification appearance of these lesions. Now, when you go to the higher magnification, you may come across a situation like this, where in fact here the cells look a little bit oncocytic, quite oncocytic in fact, and the nuclear features well are there, a little bit of pallor, but not really something that you are absolutely confident about. Some dark cells, this by the way, both these pictures happen to be from a case, which I have taken out, a case which was later proven to be a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma on histopathology, right? So you have got some of the features, even though Gimsa, you start seeing some amount of grooving, not very clear, not much of inclusions. So this is one of the situations where we face in follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma where the nuclear features are not really screaming at you and asking you to call them as papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now, let's look at this. Now, this is, these are two pictures. To the left is a papillary thyroid carcinoma usual type. To the right is one example, a particular example of a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma where the nuclear features are not very clear. And if you just put the two side by side, you can say for sure, you can say and you can appreciate the fact that here it is pretty, pretty sure, you're pretty sure, you're absolutely clear that this is a papillary thyroid carcinoma. But here the nuclear features, mm, well, not very sure. However, you can come across situations like this. This again is another example of a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, proven of histopathology. And look at the nuclear features here. I think it here you can be a little bit more certain with a slightly more opened up chromatin. You can start seeing some nice grooves over here. Look at that. So this is another example of follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma where you are going to be a little bit more confident in calling it as such. So just these two, uh, you know, last three slides, I'm just trying to show you that how even in follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma the nuclear features can be different sometimes easy to call sometimes not so easy the next one can uh, is really very difficult 
it is the macrofollicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. The difficulty comes from the fact because we are mentally trained to call something colloid goiter when you see a lot of colloids. So the moment we put a slide okay, in a microscope and you see lots of colloid, we say, ah, this is okay. So this is benign. Not in this case. Not in this case. This is a variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma which can show an abundant amount of colloid. And when you go on the higher magnification, you are going to find some features of papillary thyroid carcinoma, but they can actually be very, very subtle, making things very difficult. Papillary structures and samoma bodies are not seen. Fortunately, this is one of the rarest variant of papillary thyroid carcinomas. One of the earliest cases of papillary thyroid carcinoma macrofollicular variant was actually reported from here in Kuwait by Dr. Ayas Jasser and I think Dr. Waiki. I couldn't get my hand onto on to the particular article, so I had to uh, uh, get these pictures from uh, from a different article by Luisa M, which is published in Cyto Journal. As you can see over here, that uh, there is an abundant amount of colloid, and these are the cells. So if you just see a field like this, you might think, oh, this is a colloid goiter. And here, in fact, in this particular article, you can say that uh, there are intranuclear inclusions, some grooves, but this is not the case. Most of the times, the features may be very, very subtle, and this can be very, very easily missed. But as I said, luckily for us cytologists, this is an extremely rare, possibly the rarest variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Next, the cystic papillary thyroid carcinoma. The cells may be arranged in sheets, papillary or follicles, prominent vacuums and intranuclear inclusions, fortunately, are very common, but pale chromatin is not that common. Lots of homey macrophages, lots of hemocytin laden macrophages, and a watery colloid once again. So be careful about that. So this is a cystic papillary carcinoma. You have got these papillary carcinoma cells. Uh, elongated cells with some degree of chromatin which suggests that papillary thyroid carcinoma lots of lots of foamy macrophages some of them can actually show some inclusions but this is a particular entity which we should all be very very careful about i've seen a few of them where you get a lymph node which is far removed from the thyroid you put a needle inside and what you aspirate is dark altered blood. You think, am I dealing with some kind of a hematoma or some other kind of uh, hemorrhagic uh, lesion? And you put, make the smears and most of the smears, like 99% of the smear is made up of blood. So you, you're just about to, you know, just leave the slide aside and say, okay, unsatisfactory smear. And suddenly at the corner of your eye, we start picking up these clusters. You see? These clusters, they've got like rounded ball-like clusters, and you suddenly see, oh my God, there is an inclusion over here, right? There's an intranuclear inclusion, and then you say, okay, let me go back to the slide. You start screening again, and suddenly find another cluster where there is some there is some samoma body. So what you are dealing with is a metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma in the lymph node, which has undergone cystic degeneration, giving rise to this picture. So whenever you put a needle in a lesion in the neck which comes to you as a lymph node and you aspirate dark blood the warning signs should go up please be very careful screen the slide very carefully because quite often than not there is going to be a papillary thyroid carcinoma sitting over there so this is one word of caution that i would like to just put through next this is a papillary thyroid carcinoma oncocytic variant here, the cells are arranged in papillae, sheets, microfollicles, or isolated cells. The nuclear features are those of papillary thyroid carcinoma, and that is why in FNAC you call them papillary thyroid carcinoma, or else you would possibly go and call them uh, uh, herthal cell neoplasm, right? But they show a wide range of morphological variations, and so the DDs would include a herthal cell tumor. It could be an oncocytic medullary thyroid carcinoma, very difficult, because oncocytic medullary thyroid carcinoma can show very clear-cut intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, or it could even be metastasis, excuse me, from some other oncocytic tumors. 
So this is an oncocytic variant of aptly thyroid carcinoma. You've seen this picture before. See the abundance of cytoplasm. And there is a nucleus with a very prominent intranuclear inclusion, right? And then to your right, you see the pap, sure, a uh, very sure uh, uh, kind of oncocytic cells. You're absolutely certain about the abundant amount of granular use in fixed cytoplasm. So this is an oncocytic variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Actually, there are a number of variants of tumor. I would love to show you many more slides, but there are so many different entities that for the sake of time, I have to just select some of the cases from our archives and show them to you. So this is, I felt, is a pretty good representation of an oncocytic variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. The next one, there is something which is called a Wharton-like papillary thyroid carcinoma. What do you find in this? You find are papillary fragments which are lined by oncocytes and there is a marked lymphocytic proliferation within the core. To add to your O's, these are often associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, so it is extremely difficult to pick these up. But you will find classic nuclear features of papillary thyroid carcinomas, but once again, you know that some of the nuclear features that you associate with papillary thyroid carcinomas are also seen in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, right? Otherwise, the differentiation is from Hashimoto's where you usually find a prominent single nucleolus in the oncocyte as compared to the intranuclear inclusions, but rarely you can. It is a very difficult diagnosis, okay? And this is a set of slides. So the most important thing is what you see over here. So what you see over here, what you see usually you would find in any case of uh, uh, an autoimmune thyroiditis, okay? So you see these clusters of cells with uh, very tight aggregates, almost like tissue fragments. I won't call them clusters, sorry about that. So large, tight aggregates of cells, tissue fragments, lots of lymphocytes, epithelial cells mixed with them. And then they usually show these cells, maybe showing some degree of chromatin pallor, Another group showing these features, they may not show all the inclusions. It's a difficult diagnosis. Quite often it is missed, by the way. Here you can sign some amount of nuclear pallor. Just, I wish I would have given you a bigger picture. But this is more or less an idea of a worthen like papillary thyroid carcinoma. These lesions are there. They're again very rare, but you should keep that at the back of your mind, especially, especially when you are dealing with a nodule in the background of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is a kind of a pitfall, it can be missed. So if you remember this, you might take a closer look and might come to this entity and come across groups of cells with classic features of papillary thyroid carcinoma and refine your diagnosis. Next is papillary thyroid carcinoma toll cell variant. In the toll cell variant, the papillary structures, they're present in papillary structures and loose aggregates. The cells actually can be polygonal but the important ones are the elongated in the cylindrical cells with the height by definition. This is more of a histopathological definition, but you try to follow it in cytopathology also. Height is over three times their width. So you try to look at that. They have an elongated nuclei, may have prominent nucleoli. That's pretty interesting. But fortunately, most of them or all of them show many intranuclear cytoplasm inclusion. That is exactly what our experience was when we looked at a number of these cases and we published it. And this is one variant where mitosis may be present. The important fact is that papillary thyroid carcinoma with tall cells have a higher incidence of local recurrence and distant metastasis, and they may have an aggressive course. So it is essential to pick up tall cell components. So even if you are dealing with a papillary thyroid carcinoma with all the usual features, if you see some tall cells, please include it in your report. And this is one such case. I don't think any of us would have any doubt in calling them as tall. Look at these cells. Four cells lying side by side. Tall cells here on the game side. It is not that clear, but still you can make out that these are tall cells. See the nuclear towards one of the ends. Here is a very prominent intranuclear inclusion. So these are two representative pictures of the tall cell variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. And uh, we published a series of cases with a special reference to tall cell variant and some of the other variants on final glass patient cytology back in 2004 in Actor Cytological. This is another picture of one of the cases of tall cell variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Look at these cells. So 
So these are tau cells. So the next variant, so look at these are the tau cells. The next variant is uh, something which comes almost side by side is a columnar cells. In columnar cells, the arrangement once again is in papillae loose clusters or flat sheets, columnar to splendid cells with bipolar and wispy cytoplasm, elongated hyperchromatic nucleus as compared to the pale chromatin of classic papillary thyroid carcinoma. So here the nuclei tend to be a little bit more hyperchromatic, grooves are less frequent, and so are intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions. You can have focal vacuoles. The pitfall is that, well, if you're not doing a really good FNA, you might put, the needle might go into uh, the respiratory tract and you can pick up some respiratory epithelium and think that this is a columnar cell PTC, which of course it is not. But more often than not, while you do the FNA, if you're the one doing the FNA, the patient is going to cough. So that is a pretty good clue. It is, once again, a rare but aggressive tumor with relatively poor outcome. Now, this particular set of pictures is from an article by Sen et al. published in Cytojournal in 2014. And what they say, and what we all know, is the fact that we look for this kind of a stratification of a nuclei. You see a kind of a nuclear stratification here. A little bit of stratification here. The nuclei are supposedly more hyperchromatic. Here looks, yeah, okay, not as pale chromatin that you expect to find in papillary thyroid carcinoma. So this is a kind of forming, almost forming a rosette. So this is a columnar cell variant to papillary thyroid carcinoma. Picture taken from the web, from the journal, a cytojournal, from an article by Sen et al. 2014. So thanks to them. Next, papillary thyroid carcinoma, the solid variant. We are moving through papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now a few more variants are left before we move into other tumors. As far as the arrangement and architectures are concerned, there are three patterns. And this is very important. This is the one which defines it, a cohesive and sensitive tissue fragments. You can have a macrofollicular with trabeculate, trabecular pattern. You can sometimes have a non-cohesive single cell pattern. The nuclear features are those of classic PTC. But because of this pattern, the DDs include papillary thyroid carcinoma, with a solid variant, Follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, poorly differentiated papillary thyroid carcinoma. This is very, very important because even they may show some kind of intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, but they have a granular chromatin and they have a very high NC ratio. I'm going to show you a slide. And even medullary thyroid carcinomas are important, but the nuclear characters supposedly are slightly different. So this is papillary thyroid carcinoma, a solid variant. As you see, these are more syncytial overlapping sheets and fragments of cells. See how tightly packed the cells are. It doesn't show the kind of separation, although you can find a little bit of uh, overlapping in the usual variant, but this is too much of an overlap. And in between, you can still see some kind of intranuclear inclusion. This is another big tissue fragment, extremely hypertight, and this is one on Gimsa. The next one is a very interesting variant. It is the diffuse sclerosing variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. The presentation is something very, very important. Usually affect young women. But the important thing is that they present as goiter with diffuse enlargement of both lobes of the thyroid. So if somebody comes to you with a diffuse enlargement of both lobes of the thyroid, you might not think that this you are dealing with a malignancy, right? But these tumors typically present with diffuse enlargement of both lobes of the thyroid, but then she would have had an ultrasound where it shows a kind of a snowstorming effect because of the extensive amount of microcalcification. And so the radiologist is going to tell you, see, based on these features, I'm not very sure we might be dealing with this. Again, it occurs in young women. Now, the cell arrangement, and I've got some pictures, the cell, the cell arrangement are usually in three-dimensional ball-like clusters. This is the key. You see cells with large cytoplasmic vacuoles. When you see these cells, they are very suggestive of this particular lesion. However, when you see cells with large cytoplasmic vacuoles, you possibly move towards making thinking of a diagnosis of metastasis, but not in this case. Here, in this particular tumor, again, very rare, cells show a large cytoplasmic vacuole. Sometimes they can have dense cytoplasm. Hobdailing can be pretty frequent. And they have lesser amount of chromatin pallor, 
fewer INCIs according to some reports, but the one case that we have seen in our department that was packed with intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, it turned out to be a diffuse sclerosing variant of papyrotyroid carcinoma. I'm going to show you the picture. It shows numerous samoma bodies, and most of the samoma bodies that I showed you was actually from that case. You can see like a wide buffet of samoma bodies. Numerous lymphocytes and plasma cells in the background. Another feature, like you saw in the warthin like variant of papri thyroid carcinoma, this is another variant where you see a lot of lymphocytes and plasma cells in the background. So if you're not very careful, if you're not looking at the cell, in a patient with a diffuse enlargement of both lobes of the thyroid, you might start moving and into the pitfall of making a diagnosis of a Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And again, squamous metaplastic cells can be seen, which again can be found in uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So we have to be extremely careful. But when you see so many samoma bodies, I think you're going to it's going to catch your attention enough to look deeper into it. The DDs are lymphocytic thyroiditis. They're very tricky since this particular variant show lymphocytes and uh, can show nuclear changes of PTCA, but please pay attention to the history, the ultrasound appearance, no storming on ultrasound, be very careful, and the multitude of Samoa bodies. This really is like an exhibition of Samoa bodies in front of you when you see such slides. And squamoid cells and vacuolated cells, they should sound the pitfall alert, at least in my opinion. This is one case we saw, and that was way back in 1999. Right, uh, and we, uh, we we have that particular slide in our departmental archives, and we keep going back to that. But this is what I was talking about. You see this? So this is not a kind of morphology that you usually associate with papillary thyroid carcinoma. So look at this; like a nice ball of cell, cells in balls, and the cytoplasm is is clear. It's clear cytoplasm, right? And here you can even start seeing some amount of secretion in the cytoplasm. And very sharp margins, almost looking like hobnail cells. They are actually hobnail cells, right? These are the cells over here. And you see lots of samoma bodies. See, like hobnail-like cells coming out of this and lots and lots of samoma bodies and calcifications on a low magnification, which is coming out on the team sustain. Right. The next variant is a pretty recent variant. It is called the Tribriform modular variant of papyrothyroid carcinoma. This is a variant if you can pick up, it's not very easy to pick up, if you can pick up, this variant, some of them at least, are associated with the familial adenomatous polyposis, cola, uh, polyposis or cardinal syndrome. And so you may be the first one to possibly suggest that this may be a patient of, uh, this is associated with uh, the FAP syndrome, so as cardinal syndrome. The arrangement is round to oval, slit-like spaces are present within cells, sheets and clusters. Papillary arrangements are seen and there are eddy formation and morule. So this is one of the key diagnostic features. I'm going to show you a picture of that. Morules or eddy formations. If you see those things in a papillary thyroid carcinoma otherwise, this might be a, the variant that you're talking about. The cells are columnar to spindle. So even this is another type apart from the tall cell variant and the columnar variant, which can show columnar cells, there is stromatin clearing, nuclear groups, and intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions are mostly rare. And you can use beta catenin nuclear staining, and it is going to be turned out to be positive beta catenin staining in the nuclear amine in those cases which are associated with FAP. Now, this is a set of pictures picked up from the web. This is not our case, right? This was an article published by. Amelet Tejero et al. published in Modern Pathology pretty recent in 2019. So in these clusters, if you can really think about it, you can pick up, you can start looking at this kind of spaces which possibly represent the so-called cribriform spaces within them. Right? Look at this space here. So there are these cell-free areas, okay? And then there are some areas where these tall cells are present. And these balls of cells, these are the so-called modules which should uh, catch your attention if you come across one such case. If they are positive for beta catenin in the nuclei, it is going to help. So if you see something like this, think of these possibilities, take the history and do a beta catenin stain. The next variant is the hobnail variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. 
the cells are arranged in papillary structures, you can have micropapillary structures which lack cohesiveness and there is a kind of a loss of polarity. The cells have hobnail features with tapering cytoplasm and eccentrically placed nucleus. These tumors are important to, you know, if you can pick them up, because they have very poor outcomes and they frequently metastasize to the lung. Okay, so, and it's quite possible that you may be aspirating a lung mets from a hobnail cell variant of papillary thyroid carcin. And this is a representation of these hobnail cells. You see the cells over here and they're just hobnailing out, like you see in some histopathology sections. See the hobnail cells coming out, right? And these are the hobnail cells. So these are the hobnail cells, which, by the way, may be found in papillary thyroid carcinomas, but not as a major component. Okay, so this is one variant called hobnail cell variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. The next one is a very tricky one because this is technically not a malignancy. It's called the hyalinizing trabecular adenoma. And I guess that many cytologists across the world has made the mistake of calling this particular variant as a papillary thyroid carcinoma. So it's called the hyalinizing trabecular adenoma. This is not a papillary thyroid carcinoma. So here, we, we have, and we have actually got a couple of cases I'm going to show you the pictures from. The cells are arranged in fragments with a hyaline core. So look at the associated features. Hyaline core and neoplastic cells irradiating out. Smaller aggregates and follicles with hyaline cores may also be seen. So hyaline cores are the key. Think of hyaline cores. The cells are round to spindle. They show frequent grooves and that's where all the confusion begins. Frequent groups and look at this, frequent intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusion. So if you have to think of one lesion which is not actually malignant, not technically malignant, and it shows the most number of intranuclear inclusion, this would be the variant. So if you see a lot of in intranuclear inclusions and you have made a mistake, it might be a hyalinizing trabecular adenoma. And there is something called paranuclear yellow bodies which may be seen. They can also show a lot of samoma bodies. You see how things are getting more and more difficult. But they behave in a benign way because they are regarded as a variant of follicular adenoma in spite of the morphological and some amount of genetical, genetic similarity with papillary thyroid carcinomas. Right. On immunohistochemistry, cytochemistry or histochemistry, you see positivism for thyroglobulin. Good, helpful. TTF1, they are TTF1 positive, right? But this is a very, very helpful feature if you are using it. If you do TI67, it shows a cytoplasmic and membranous staining instead of the nuclear staining. Okay, so if you see that, it's useful. If you do a type 4 collagen, if you have it, it is going to just go around the tumor cell, especially if you're doing a cell block. The neuroendocrine markers and calcitonin are negative. So it is a very weird looking tumor. And in the thyroid, whenever you see something which is very weird, you should always rule out a medullary thyroid carcinoma. So the neuroendocrine marker negativity and calcitonin negativity Else, but remember, a very few cases could show focal calcitonin positivism. So if you're just seeing a few cells here and there and you're seeing calcitonin positivism, well, it is not exactly a, you know, a medullary uh, a hyalinizing trabecular uh, adenoma. If you see some amount of focal, you can, so I mean, it's not exactly a medullary, uh, sorry about that, it's not exactly a medullary carcinoma if it is just focal. So you have to take into consideration the other features of thyroglobulin and TTF, uh, TT, uh, thyroglobulin positivism. TTF1 can be positive in medullary thyroid carcinomas. So this is one of our cases. In fact, there are two cases mixed in one in this particular slide. So this is what you see. You see this core, and this is the core. You see this, this empty spaces, some amount of hyaline material here. And the cells are just run, jutting out of it. Almost looks like, if you're not very careful, you might think that you are dealing with possibly a columnar cell variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma because there is some amount of stratification over here looks very much like that okay and this is what you look for you see this material which is present in the middle of the, in the center of the follicle this is the kind of hyaline material and this is the hyaline material you're talking about so when you start seeing things like this this is very striking this you are not going to miss this is going to catch your eye and if you know the condition and you remember this picture you are going to think of a hyalinizing trabecular adenoma, I'm pretty certain. So please keep a nice mental snapshot of this particular image. Okay? 
this kind of image. And this is again one of the tissue fragments you see. This material, it is, doesn't have the typical look of capillaries running here and there. No, this is mostly acellular material which is present in the core of these areas. And once again, some amount of hyaline material over here in between follicles or even you might think start thinking in terms of a follicular neoplasm in these particular cases but the, because follicular neoplasm sometimes can also show this kind of material and this typically kind of a hyaline material this we did not that when we did diagnose the hyaline is in trabecular adenoma we suggested and it was found out to be hyalinizing trabecular adenoma on histopathology but uh, that was a time when we were not aware of this particular staining pattern, that is KI67, which shows a membranous staining pattern, which is extremely helpful. We didn't have the cell blocks of these particular cases at that time, so we couldn't you know, just try and do it on our material, but we have got our eyes open. If we come across one such case, and even now, when we suspect a hyalinized intravicular adenoma, we do run KI67. This, of course, is not our case. This was a case which I got from the web, published by Chang et al. in ultrasonography. Right, next, the big group, medullary thyroid carcinoma. So we are through from papillary thyroid carcinomas. We are going to just be visiting it once more, just for a short while, a little bit later. Cells can look, so medullary thyroid carcinomas are one tumor, the, the one group of, or, or, or a particular tumor, which I think like melanomas can look like anything. Okay, you think of anything in your head, you dream of any morphological pattern, and medullary thyroid carcinomas can have it. Most of the time, the cells are present in clusters or as isolated cells. Look at the shape of the cell. The cells can be polygonal, oval, round, spindle, plasma cytoid. You just think of it. It shows mild to moderate pleomorphism. Sometimes it can show extreme pleomorphism. Some of the most pleomorphic cells you are going to find in medullary thyroid carcinoma. And that is why whenever you are dealing with a very anaplastic tumor in the thyroid, and when you are trying to, when you are absolutely certain that you are doing with an anaplastic thyroid CA, we are going to see that particular lesion very soon. You should always keep medullary thyroid carcinoma, the very anaplastic type of medullary thyroid carcinoma at the back of your mind. You have to exclude that possibility. The nuclear shows a salt and pepper appearance, typical chromatin. I'm going to see some pictures. They may rarely show intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions according to literature, but I see it pretty often in medullary thyroid carcinoma, which has been proven as medullary thyroid carcinoma may show nucleoli. The cytoplasm on MGG can show fine magenta granules, very, very, very helpful. Rarely it can show pigment, right? And this is very, very important. It can show pigment rarely, so please remember that it can, it can show the pigment, especially a particular variant of medullary thyroid carcinoma. is called the paraganglioma-like variant of medullary thyroid carcinoma. It can show pigments, right? It, you can find amyloid, and I I mentioned in the previous uh, webinar that it is very, very difficult sometimes to differentiate amyloid from inspissated colloid. The immunohistochemistry, positive for neuroendocrine markers, positive for calcitonin with some pitfalls. We are going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, uh, CA positive, okay, in some of the cases, may have some prognostic significance. Many thyroid carcinomas are often TTF1 positive. Okay, so... Do not use TTF1 to differentiate medullary thyroid carcinoma from follicular neoplasm, so papillary thyroid carcinoma, don't do it. Paxate, well, it is a marker of thyroid lesion, can be very variable, can be positive in some of the cases. Now, one of the things which has come up is that if you do needle rinses for medullary thyroid carcinoma and measure calcitonin, we don't do it. A rise in calcitonin, you know, a high calcitonin level in the needle rinses may be helpful in the diagnosis of medullary thyroid carcinoma. By the way, I'm not going into the so-called clinical aspects of familial medullary thyroid carcinomas and other men syndromes because we really are short of time so I'm not going to go into that. I'm just trying to concentrate mostly on the morphological aspects. You can read about this or you can hear about them in other webinars or lectures. Right. This is a collage of medullary thyroid carcinomas. As you can see over here, it's a big fragment, cells just falling apart from over here at this particular magnification. Very difficult. Here again, it shows kind of a microfollicular pattern, right? But again, cells coming out over here. Again, a very low magnification with cells falling apart. But look at this one. This is a pretty helpful. Very isolated population of cells. Cells are separate, a dispersed population of cells. This material is most likely amyloid, right? And the cells show an isonucleosis. Isolated population of cells showing an isonucleosis. Very, very. Uh, commonly found, I'd rather say, in medullary thyroid carcinoma. Once again, you see a very similar pattern. 
and uh, you see the cell with an intranuclear inclusion. This here would be your so-called classic, your all-time favorite plasmacytoid cells. We like to see plasmacytoid cells because they're easy to identify. And we know that when you see a thyroid aspirate and you see plasmacytoid cells, it is, you know, we do, you don't miss medullary thyroid carcinomas. We know, okay, well, we are dealing with a medullary thyroid carcinoma. Of course, there are exceptions. So we like to see plasmacytoid cells. But here is, the, when I look at the, when I try to appreciate the nuclear features, I always look at the PAP. And in the PAP, you can see the chromatin. It is a typical stipple, so-called salt and pepper chromatin, which is typical of medullary thyroid carcinoma. As you see over here, you over here. And if you want to just go to the next slide, I think this makes it very clear. What is the difference between a stippled chromatin of metary thyroid carcinoma and the so-called tail chromatin with grooves of papillary thyroid carcinoma? So I think this slide gives you a fair amount of idea. Of course, you have to see more and more slides, more and more cases. Especially, I mean, I mean the ones who are getting into cytology during their residency and residency programs. So you have to actually see them on the slides, okay, uh, on your microscope slide. But this should give you kind of a guide. So here is the so-called stippled chromatin, and this is the opened up chromatin. These are the nuclear grooves, so you can see the difference between a medullary carcinoma, thyroid carcinoma, and a usual variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. So, here is something which I find very difficult. So, this is something which was called a follicular neoplasm, slash suggestive of follicular neoplasm, and this is a medullary thyroid carcinoma. Now, frankly speaking, I, am, I don't find this an extremely useful feature. Because to me, sometimes, sometimes the follicular neoplasms also show features which are very close to the so-called stipple chromatin of uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma. Maybe it depends on the way the things are stained in your department. We have a very good uh, staining system. Our technicians are extremely good. But in spite of that, I find it very difficult to differentiate between this nuclear feature and this nuclear feature. This is an honest confession, but others may have may differ with me. Right. This is the type of medullary thyroid carcinoma. We come once in a while. This is a spindle cell variant of medullary thyroid carcinoma. So if you have a spindle cell tumor in the thyroid, think of a medullary thyroid carcinoma. Another tumor which might look like this is a type A thymoma occurring in the thyroid. Extremely rare. The pitfall alert is that, just like some of the medullary thyroid carcinomas, thymomas can be CA positive. But just to make a note, but this is a spindle cell variant of medullary thyroid carcinoma. This is just to show you immunohistochemistry of a panel, which we did uh, some time back. So this is the Cell block, calcitonin positive, CEA positive. And look at this, TTF1, nuclear stain, TTF1 was positive. So medullary thyroid carcinomas can be TTF1 positive and I, I find them to be quite frequently TTF1 positive. So this is a pretty uh, uh, interesting entity. Medullary thyroid carcinoma and follicular carcinoma mixed. So very few tumors can have both of them mixed, right? What can you, but can you do that on FNA? Can you diagnose it on FNA? Not, uh, it's difficult. Now here you have got these cells. These are cells of the medullary cancer. But then you have these kind of aggregates of cells coming. They're not exactly microfollicles. Maybe something over here. But even medullary thyroid carcinomas can show microfollicles. But when you see something like this, it is very difficult to say that if you are dealing with a medullary thyroid carcinoma mixed with a follicular carcinoma, or is it that the medullary carcinoma has infiltrated to areas where there are normal follicular cells and they are just mixed together while you are doing the aspirate. And even if you do, you know, a cell block and you do the presence and, and you find both calcitonin and thyroglobulin to suggest it, it is still very tricky. So my suggestion would be that in these cases, just put it as a kind of a possibility that the admixture of a follicular neoplasm associated with it cannot be excluded and do his and of course it will be found out in histopathology this happened to be a case where he put it as a suggestion and on subsequent histopathology it was found to be a mixed medullary and follicular carcinoma but i am not saying that these two smears are a perfect representation of that this is just to highlight a situation or a problem which you might come across once in a while next Poorly differentiated thyroid cancers. We are off medullary thyroid carcinomas. Cells are arranged in solid sheets and clusters, insulin, microfollicles, and isolated cells. Endothelial wrapping, if you are able to pick up, very uh, helpful. 
cells are very scanty cytoplasm as compared to the usual variant of hyperthyroid carcinoma, but sometimes they may have abundant oncocytic cytoplasm, which in that case, I think it will be almost impossible to call it as such, very difficult. Unless and until you are looking at things like mitosis and apoptosis, which are typically present, nuclei are hyperchromatic, not the pale chromatin, minimally pleomorphic. They are positive for cytokeratin, thyroglobulin, TTF1, and Paxate. Nothing uh, surprising over there. They are difficult to diagnose on FNA. Let's be honest, they are not very easy to pick up on FNA, and many are diagnosed as uh, suggestive of follicular neoplasm, and sometimes even follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, and so, uh, and even sometimes NHL when the, there is an isolated pattern. And this is a set of slides which have been uh, kindly provided by uh, my guru, Professor Pranob Bey from PGIM at Chandigarh. So he sent me this as an example of poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. As you can see, that there's a highly cellular on these uh, sheets and aggregates, and look at them. Hardly any cytoplasm, very tightly packed cells. It will be very, very difficult. I don't see any mitosis here though, but I'm sure you'll be for mitosis here. And there almost looks here like something like almost like a small cell carcinoma, not exactly. I mean, don't take that for granted. So it's not exactly that, but this kind of very tight clusters, you can't, we can't really think of anything. You can't put it under papillary, you can't put it under follicular because it's too hyperchromatic. Think of this as a possible restart, and you start picking up a lot of mitosis. Uh, it might be a poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. The next one is something which is hardly ever missed, but sometimes they might be missed. I'll tell you where. Undifferentiated anaplastic carcinomas with thyroid. Uh, usually, patients are above 50, but sometimes you can find in younger patients. We saw one, uh, I think, uh, which was a younger patient with extremely poor prognosis. Smears are usually markedly cellular. It showed aggregates of variable sizes and isolated cells. The cell morphology can be very variable. You can actually have a small cell variant of anaplastic thyrocarcinoma, and you can think that how difficult that is going to be. And some of them can be giant cell variants. So look at the vari variation from small to giant. Cells can be polygonal, spindle, round, plasma, cytoid. There is a rhabdoid variant. Okay, which may look like oncocytic. They show extreme pleomorphism. You will never, ever miss them out as non-malignant lesion. No, you, they, are, they are just, they just uh, uh, look back at you. Okay? Uh, irregular nuclear outlines sometimes may show intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, but I don't think that is going to be a problem because the other amount of pleomorphism is so marked that you are not going to call it a papillary thyroid carcinoma. No, you won't. Uh, Others, you can find necrosis, inflammation. You can actually have these tumors as a kind of an undifferentiated component arising on a papillary thyroid carcinoma. That can make things very difficult. Uh, but there is a particular variant, which is a hyalinized and hypocellular variant, which is fibrotic, which can lead, give you very, very hypocellular smears with a few cells here and there, and you might miss it. Now look at the immuno. They are pan-cytokeratin positive, vimentin positive, Pax8 is most often positive and this is the most useful marker. Why? Because the other ones which you associate with the thyroid origin, that is thyroglobulin, TTF1 and calcitonin are negative in this tumor. So these tumors are of thyroid origin, but they're negative for all these markers. The only and the most useful marker is Pax8 and sometimes they can even be Pax8 negative. Right, so this is an anaplastic carcinoma of the thyroid. It is a spindle cell predominant. This is not a hist this is not a term. This is not an official term. This is just a picture, and that is sometimes you see a lot of spindle cells, which looks like a sarcoma, very anaplastic cells. You see how anap look at this cell. It's an absolutely monstrous looking cell over here. So that is a spindle cell uh, predominant type. Again, it's not a name. This is just the picture, which just to help you understand anaplastic carcinoma oval. Polygonal cell predominant. And there are some tumors where the cells are more oval and polygonal, but still a significant amount of pleomorphism. Some multinuclear giant cells will help you out, but this is a so called oval uh, or polygonal predominant cell population in anaplastic carcinoma. Squamous so cell carcinomas of the thyroid are extremely rare. You have to always rule out the possibility of something coming from uh, invading from the adjacent areas. Uh, Pax, they are Pax8 positive. Most of the other tumors in the surrounding areas, in the neck, they are Pax8 negative. 
and therefore since they are vaccine positive, it is felt that they may be related to the anaplastic carcinomas of the uh, thyroid carcinomas. Next, metastatic tumors. One tumor, I'm going to just rush through them. One tumor which is important, which comes to the thyroid pretty frequently is a metastatic RCC. Uh, of course, when you have a problem, you can use immunohistochemistry, thyroglobulin positivism. PTF1 positivism should help along with RCC and CD10 on the other side should help in differentiating them from each other. This is a picture of a metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Once again, thank you, Pranoda, for this, for uh, kindly providing this slide. Metastatic melanoma. These are again tumors which lead to plasma cytoid cells, spindle cells, and very anaplastic cells. They can have pigments, but please remember that medullary carcinomas of the thyroid can also show pigment. Okay, so we have to be very careful about that. And they are, of course, positive for HMB45, melan A, and S100. And this is what it looks like, so-called plasma cytoid cells, looks almost like a medullary carcinoma, having some sort of a pigment, but then you do your immunos and you find that they are positive for HMB45 and other melanocytic markers. And you know this patient had a melanoma somewhere else, and so it is a metastasis of the melanoma. Metastatic breast carcinomas possibly are the commonest things which come to the thyroid according to some series. So uh, you have to use immunohistochemistry for thyroglobulin, TTF1, calcitonin, ER, PR, and this for it being a thyroid tumor. Breast tumors, of course, are ER, PR. Some of, many of them are ER, PR positive. So if they're positive, it helps. And beta 3 obviously is going to help you in calling something as a metastatic breast carcinoma. And this happened to be one such example of a breast carcinoma metastasizing to the thyroid. You could have metastatic, metastatic carcinomas from the lung with the non-small cell type and the small cell type. This is just for the record. I do not really have any pictures. You can later on just go through the points. And before we go to the lymph reticular malignancies, as I've said, most lymphomas of the thyroid are B-cell NHLs and about two-thirds of them are related to Hashimoto's. Secondary involvement is far more common. The two major types are diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and malt lymphomas. They have a dispersed cell population. And there are three patterns which are possible. You can find a mixture of small and large lymphocytes. You can have a monotonous population of large lymphoid cells. And you can have a monotonous population of small lymphoid cells. If you have a monotonous population of large lymphoid cells, this is possibly the easiest to diagnose. If not, you can use flow cytometry, which is very useful. And will give you reports of... Uh, and there have been reports of, but the important thing is that there have been reports of Hashimoto's thyroiditis showing clonal population. So please be careful, that is a pitfall. Hodgkin's of the thyroid is extremely rare. And so these are some of the other points that I have with these slides. Uh, and, uh, it may mimic thyroiditis or even anaplastic carcinoma, depending on representation of small to medium sized cells. If you have a very anaplastic, uh, you know, very pleomorphic looking tumor, you may think of an anaplastic carcinoma, but then immunohistochemistry can help. This is a large B-cell lymphoma. You will not have any problem in calling this as malignant, right? Look at these cells. If this is a different large B-cell lymphoma of the thyroid. Large cells, cytoplasm, lymphoid, and of course, very important, look at these structures. Lymphoglandular bodies, right? When they are present, they are very helpful. This is a malt lymphoma, turned out to be a malt lymphoma, population of small lymphocytes mixed with a few larger cells. Some people may have, many may have problem in directly calling this as malignant. So in such cases, you ask for flow cytometry and then you can, if you have the supportive features, you call it lymphoma or else you call it suggestive or, sus or suspicious of malignancy. Here is a situation where you have a mixture of large cells and small cells. Once again, depending on how sure you are, you can directly call it NHL, possibly involving, you know, some kind of a partial involvement, but rarely, you know, you can, uh, you can or, or otherwise you can just call it as uh, suggestive. Okay. In, with this kind of large cells, I would go straight and call it an NHL. So this is one example of a Langhorne cell histiocytosis, just putting it through because this is one of the tumors you can find in the thyroid. Of course, the background will show other cells like um, the small lymphocytes and sometimes uh, sometimes eosinophils, they really are not shown up well, but then look at these cells, the Langerhans cells with grooves. So everything which has a groove in the thyroid is not necessarily a papillary thyroid carcinoma. Paragangliomas, 
can be present in the thyroid, right? And uh, they can be a problem. They are uh, usually T they are TTF1, uh, they are TTF1 and TG negative, right? Uh, synaptophysin positive. So uh, if they are present, they are very very difficult, and especially because there is a paraganglioma-like variant of medullary thyroid carcinoma. And there are lots of other lesions which have been described. So this brings us to the end of the part on the morphology and I have got a little bit left because it's very very long. I've got a very brief overview of some of the ancillary techniques because I promised you that I'm going to be dealing with them. So I've kept it nice and short. So we are going to talk about the ancillary methods in terms of immunocytochemistry, flow cytometry I'm not going to talk about and molecular cytopathology. Right. So the role of immunocytochemistry in thyroid cytopathology, the broad overview and essential points. So first of all, you can think of immunocytochemistry in distinguishing differentiated thyroid cancers from benign conditions. That is, can we use immunocytochemistry to sort out cases which we put in Bethesda 3 and 4? And other is immunocytochemistry in other situations. Now, a lot has been done, including one work from our lab, where you have tried to use a number of stains, antibodies to try and sort it out and most of them have shown extremely encouraging results in trying to differentiate between you know a benign and a malignant condition okay but how good are they you know in a practical under practical circumstances so first of all I just tell you some essential one if you have positive staining for CK19, HBME1, Galactin3 and CD44 and it is negatively stained for CD56 and e -caterin. You are It supports a diagnosis of a malignant differentiated thyroid tumor like papillary thyroid carcinoma over a benign condition. The papillary or a follicular carcinoma over a benign condition like a colloid goiter or an adenomatous nodule. Okay, so these are the stains which have been commonly used. Now, they have different kinds of sensitivities and specificities but it has been also shown that if you use a combination of markers, it enhances the sensitivity and specificity. So, for example, if you are trying to use either CK19 alone or HBME alone or Galactin3 alone, if you combine them together and then look at your data, you will find a higher degree of sensitivity and specificity. And the literature is replete with studies with encouraging results. We have seen that. However, this is a very important thing and that's why you have to go to the next group of ancillary techniques. According to the recommendation of the Bethesda system, the immunocytochemistry profile based on distinction are not sufficient. Let me tell you, it's not sufficient to filter out the benign cases. And so the next steps are repeat cytology, molecular tests, or surgery, depending upon the circumstances and other de determinants. Okay, so, but I think it is also going to depend on your practice situation, whether the availability of molecular techniques, which may not be available in most of the places, and how your clinician looks at the case as a whole, and decides to go ahead with surgery or not to go ahead with surgery. Right. What about ICC in other circumstances? What about thyroglobulin? Thyroglobulin, of course, are very good in distinguishing thyroid epithelial tumors from medullary thyroid carcinomas and parathyroid neoplasms. And it's also very good when you are dealing with a metastasis, you see thyroglobulin positivism, so you know it's coming from the thyroid. But anything in yellow is a bit Anaplastic carcinomas of the thyroid, as I've mentioned before, are negative. So not all tumors arising of the, the thyroid epithelial cells are positive. So thyroid anaplastic carcinoma of the thyroid are negative for thyroglobin. Thyroid transcription factors will be present in expressed in most thyroid epithelial tumors. Once again, negative in anaplastic carcinomas. Medullary carcinomas are often TTF1 positive. So be very careful. Don't use it to differentiate between medullary and papillary thyroid or follicular thyroid carcinomas. Calcitonin, very important. Medullary thyroid carcinomas versus tumors of the thyroid follicular cells you can use or you can use sometimes medullary thyroid carcinomas versus paragangliomas differentiate between these two conditions. But there is a pitfall. Some cases may show patchy expressions of metacalcitonin. So if you put a needle into an area which is not showing an expression of calcitonin and you are sure that you are dealing with a papillary or the, with the calcium with the medullary thyroid carcinoma, it doesn't mean it is no longer a medullary thyroid carcinoma. It could still be a medullary thyroid carcinoma. And in such cases, if you have the facilities, you can do in situ hybridization for calcitonin mRNA or CG reactive protein mRNA. Medullary calcitonin also, now this is again very important, it may be present in extra thyroid neuroendocrine tumors. And so when you are trying to find out the metastasis of a tumor, 
of a neuroendocrine tumor in the distant site and it turns out to be calcitonin positive, it does not automatically mean that we are dealing with a metastasis from a thyroid carcinoma because some other tumors, other neuroendocrine tumors outside thyroid can be calcitonin positive. CEA, it is important in medullary thyroid carcinoma that thymic tumors can be positive. Neuroendocrine markers, good for medullary thyroid carcinoma, but be very careful because follicular neoplasms may be positive for synaptophysin in 45 to 80 percent of the cases. And papillary thyroid carcinoma can even be positive for synaptophysin. Not chromogranin, but synaptophysin when you're using, be very careful. Tax 8 is very good for thyroid tumors, especially for anaplastic carcinomas. It is also helpful as a supportive feature for metastasis, okay, especially from lung, breast, GIT, which are tax 8 negative most of the time but not from metastasis from all tumors. For example, tumors from the renal and female genital tract are of course going to be tax positive as well as other tumors, not going into the details of that. As squamous cell carcinomas, okay, good from the adjacent areas, but some pulmonary squamous cell carcinomas have been shown to be tax positive, so be very careful. Lymphoid markers, of course, for lymphoreticular malignancies and other markers depending on the situation like racemase, PSA, melanin, HMB45, whatever you want. Uh, this is these can be uh, positive depending on the circumstances. Last two slides, molecular cytopathology. These are the key facts, so please pay attention. This is towards the end of the lecture. I know it's getting very long, but these are the last two slides. So the key facts, so if you have to remember something, especially if you have to, uh, for those of you who are going to write exams or other stuff, you want to know these are the important things. What is the main purpose of molecular test? The main purpose of molecular test is to stratify cases with indeterminate results. So that's where they come into play. That is the ones which you call TBS, RTC3 and 4 into clinically meaningful categories. So what is the goal? The goal is to avoid unnecessary surgery. So you have got TBS, RTC3 and 4 and you want to know which are the ones which I can just let the patient say, okay, hang on, you don't need to remove this and don't have to go under surgery. Those are the circumstances where molecular tests come into play. And sometimes it can even help you with kind of a decision making as to the extents of the surgery, which are going to do a logoectomy or near total thyroidectomy, it may help. And this is some of the available commercial tests, a former gene expression, thyroseq, thyrogenics, Rosetta Reveal. And if you want to keep up, this is what you should look at. These are the four tests. The general platform is different. This is a microarray based gene expression test. Thyroseq is a next generation sequencing test. This is a next generation sequencing test, but a targeted next generation sequencing test. We are looking for specific mutations. It is not the whole genome sequencing. No, it's a targeted next generation sequencing test. But here to this, you add a quantitative RT-PCR or uh, expression analysis of 10 miRNAs. So this is associated with microRNAs. And this is a test which is based on quantitative RT-PCR of microRNAs. So what are the result categories? Look at the result categories. Here it is benign, suspicious, or you can say this is a medullary thyroid carcinoma. If it is benign, you can avoid surgery. So this is what you're looking for. You just are looking for which are the cases which are benign. You can tell the patient, okay, you can relax now. There will be no surgery necessary at this moment. Now for thyroseq, it gives it as positive for mutation or negative, or it says it is MTC it can either tell you medullary thyroid carcinoma or parathyroid neoplasm. It can also talk, tell you about the sample adequacy and sometimes can even tell you about the functional status. But the major fact is to call it negative, avoid surgery. When it calls it positive, depending on certain mutations, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, it can give you some kind of idea and help you with the decision making to the extent of surgery. Okay, so depending on how sure you are. I, I mean, how, what kind of, what mutations those are. That is like a full seminar, maybe immunohistochemistry and other full seminar, so I cannot go into the details of that. The other one is X, where you are looking for this particular BRAP V600 or red PTC. These patients, you can say that, okay, they are 100% papillary thyroid carcinoma. So they, you just go, go up for surgery and you can they can go for a near total thyroidectomy. And then, Next, you do a, a MI, uh, um, the microRNA analysis, and based on microRNA, so if it is not BRAP V600 RTPC positive, you go for thyroid um, uh, the microRNA test, 
and based on micro RNA, you divide into high risk and low risk. And if it is low risk, you can avoid surgery. The last one is a Rosetta Reveal, and this one is only on micro RNA, which is divided into suspicious profile or low risk profile. And if it is low risk, you can go for you can avoid the surgery. So the main idea is to avoid surgery. So later on, if you want to just come and look at this particular slide, just to get a broad overview, you can do that. So before I end, a big thank you to our team at the Cytopathology Unit of Mubarak Al Kabir Hospital. Thanks to uh, Professor Kapila, Dr. Das, to my other colleagues, Dr. Sheikh, Dr. Shahid, Dr. Bahia, and a very big thank you to a superb team of technicians, cytotechnologists which we have. Most of the slides which you have seen have been taken off from my archive. It is not an easy job. We have got a fantastic filing system and they do it with a smile, so a very big thank you to them. So, uh, my last, uh, before I finish, a uh, thank you to all of you. It's been an extremely long lecture, so those of you who are here, a big thank you. And uh, Nadima, I'm just taking the opportunity to finish with a kind of an unusual thank you because this is a very, very important day for all of us across the world because we lost one of the person who entertained us. Although it is a medical related, it's a cytology lecture, it is a science lecture, but I can't help but finishing with this slide. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nadima. Yes, so that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. You took exactly 90 minutes of football match. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> one wonderful lecture. Let me just tell you one thing. Not only you are an internationally acclaimed cytopathologist, but an excellent teacher. And Thank uh, you. to explain to that is that uh, there are very few people in the world who teach Dilse. So you are teaching Dilse. You are really Thank teaching you. like a teacher should teach his students. You know, going every bit to every small things and trying to amplify things which are really required. I think this lecture will be there as an archive for everybody who will be preparing for exams, FRC exams. It's a very, very good lecture. Excellently done. You've really taken a lot of trouble to prepare this lecture. It can be very clearly seen. The extent of hard work and the way you have presented is very good. Now, I think there are some questions and I think if you're not very tired, would you no, I'm not. Nadine, I'm Thank yes, you so it's... much. I'll be happy there are a lot answer. of questions on the YouTube. So I'll go one by one. The first one is by Dr. Manoj Kahar. And he says, Sir, do all these variants of PTC have any prognostic significance or any clinical relevance in treatment? Okay, can I answer that? Yeah, please. Yeah, of course. And I have shown some of uh, the prognostic significance in the slides which were shown before I showed the pictures. A number of variants like the tall cell variant, the columnar cell variant, the uh, what do you call the, the diffuse sclerosing variant, the Hobnell variant, these tumors are associated with a poorer prognosis, more aggressive coarse Hobnell variant metastasized very frequent to the lung. But when you look at the, uh, the Bethesda system, you know, there is no separate recommendation or a separate management plan, okay, or something else that they are going to do based on any of these variants. But definitely, yes, mo many of these uh, particular variants of uh, papri thyroid carcinomas, and I have mentioned them if you go back to the slides, because I'll be, you'll, I'm sure these slides are going to be put up uh, um, later on so they can see that I have mentioned the prognostic significance of these variants in the slides preceding the pictures. Yes, they are. Right. So there's a next question. Hyalinizing trabecular adenoma. This is a question by Dr. Nuzat Rafat Sayyad. Hyalinizing trabecular adenoma will be categorized in which category of Bethesda? Hyalinizing trabecular adenoma, it is categorized in, uh, ideally it should be categorized in it is see in the Bethesda group discussion, it is discussed under five, but once you have called it hyalinizing trabecular adenoma, I think it should come under category four. That is the so-called follicular neoplasm and uh, suspicious for follicular neoplasm category because this is, or, uh, or under category five, because this is technically speaking, not a malignant tumor. So this is a kind of a gray zone. 
okay when you yeah. when you are discussing hallucinogenic right. trabecular adenoma it is discussed under the malignant tumors because possibly because they show some of the mm, features the genetic features uh, and, and some of the morphological features of papillary thyroid carcinoma but it is okay, yeah. considered to be a benign tumor okay so uh, that is a kind of it's it's a tricky one it's a tricky one but when you read the bethesda system uh, and the book they discuss it under category 6 but although typical technically it is not a malignant tumor i yeah. saw uh, there is a question coming up i think from navanita das uh, yeah, something I, I, about the yeah. one, okay, one, one can okay, we confuse sorry, because this question uh, yeah. came up yeah actually i just want to finish the youtube questions yes yeah, sure there's, there's another it's not another question it's a comment Hallucinating trabecular adenoma may show features of PTC. Yeah, it does show some features of PTC. We all know that. Yeah, that is the reason why it yeah. is extremely yeah. notorious for being misdiagnosed as PTC. Yes, yeah, it does. that's right. Now, Dr. Labanita Das, uh, she is from uh, Assam. Can we confuse hallucinating trabecular adenoma with PTC diffuse sclerosing variant? If so, how to differentiate in cytology? Uh, not really. Uh, mm. You see the diffuse sclerosing variant of papillary thyroid carcinomas, right? They usually show this so-called balls of cells, right? A lot of hobnailing pattern, and uh, it's cells with an abundant amount of cytoplasm, some amount of cytoplasmic secretions, uh, which is which looks and it will not show the kind of hyaline stroma and the hyaline material within the microfollicle as you see in. Uh, the diffuse sclerosing variant so i think that they would not be a very close differential diagnosis i don't think so yeah. another thing is that the hta generally presents as a solitary nodule and and diffuse yes. variant with yes. like yes. diffuse yes yes exactly yeah yeah, yeah. large yeah. of the thyroid the clinical yeah the clinical picture for diffuse thyromegaly of hashimoto's type of disease yeah and the ultrasound also will be yeah. a little bit no stoning effect and now we have uh, comments of appreciation thank you so much for an excellent lecture thanks for so much for an excellent teaching thank you so much excellent job rinmoy uh, i mean the <clears throat> very very well done and uh, thank you Nadine. thank you so much thank you for the for this opportunity because Hello, yes sir. i understand the situation and the the previous uh, you know conversations that we have had and i know that you are actually a man on a mission in you are the fulcrum no, no literally you are actually the fulcrum in dissipating knowledge and there is no better job and i really mean it and i am just so glad that i am a small part of it and thank you very much for the opportunity to be and when you told me that there are so many people across the world who have been listening and looking at this and, and i hope uh, listening and 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 requesting for more lectures from you i mean i'll share with you some you of much. the comments which have been pouring in from everywhere even on our youtube channel people have been commenting from way up to you know north america some people from latin america they are all come they are all seeing this these lectures and they are commenting and in their ways to ask for more there is a big group of people in indonesia entire uh, medical college in indonesia you know they view this lecture early in the morning and then they have their comments through and they are really appreciative of the effort which all these people are taking to teach everybody thank you so much dr minma thank you nadeem i think we will be you having you for more lectures on cytology sure and before sure. before i, I, I close uh, uh, let me just tell everybody that uh, the next lecture tomorrow is by dr madan it's on molecular profiling of breast carcinomas and rare subtypes of breast carcinomas i think that is something which we should all look forward to Right. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. Good night, Nadine. Bye. Bye. Good night. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.